Without further ado, I wanted to introduce our first speakers. We have Jasmine James and Chris Bolton from Delta. You probably heard Jasmine give a keynote and she teased this talk and I think everyone's really excited for it. So let's have a round of applause for Jasmine and Chris. Thank you so very much, John. Well, welcome, it's after lunch, so I'm hoping we can get some energy going here. I know everyone's nice and full. Um, so the title of this talk today is how um, we're leveraging cloud native to, be, to make information technology a differentiator at Delta. So I think we're gonna start it off with some introductions, talk about our team a little bit, and then we'll dive deep into our journey with Paz um, at Delta. So I'll start with the intros. Um, so my name is Jasmine James. I'm a manager of the DevOps Center of Excellence at, at Delta. So what is a DevOps Center of Excellence? Um, it, we essentially provide guidance and best practices as well as tooling to enable DevOps at Delta. Um, and Chris, go ahead. I'm Chris Bolton. I am the lead engineer for the app dev portion of the PaaS team. I focus primarily on the onboarding process, the developer experience, and the supported technologies for the platform. Yeah, so I think we need to talk a little bit about what the PaaS team is and um, really how our team has evolved over the years. So initially in 2017, Chris and I started about two months apart at Delta, and we solely focused on creating um, a tool chain. I talked a little bit earlier this morning about our legacy tools that were not cloud native friendly at all. So we were tasked with bringing in all of the new tools, making sure they were ready for developers to start adopting those. So since then, we've kind of like evolved into like three different arms, I think, now. So we have our core dev tools team, which manages and administers the tools. We also have a speed to market dojo that enables um, development community through education and immersive learning. And we also have the PaaS team, which I'll let Chris talk a little bit about. And this is also our first slide. Oh, there's that. OK, so yeah, the Delta PaaS team is an agile, cross-functional team that acts as a lean startup. So if you notice the cross-functional aspect to the team, that really means if you work in a large organization, we're broken down into different orgs. So we have a security org, we have an infrastructure org, and we have an application services org. So really, we came together to form one team, and we call ourselves the Delta Paths team. And so the Delta Paths team really focuses on four different sub-products. So developer experience, onboarding process, supported technologies, and platform lifecycle. So the developer experience is really around the automation of what makes the developer's life easier. So we listen to our customers, developers at Delta, and just try to automate processes for them to make their lives easier. The onboarding process is basically day one to production. So I just look at, OK, if a developer joins Delta today, what do they need day one? And then what do they need to get to production? Uh, so and then. The supported technologies is the middleware, basically. So it's something we've kind of termed supported technologies at Delta. Um, it's really what containers you can run in production on OpenShift. So we even have a way that if you want to bring your own container, if you're an app team and you want to use something that's not a part of our supported technology, uh, I don't know, kit or whatever, yeah. um, you can bring your own container as well. And it has to go through something called our architecture review board. Um, but then, and then finally, the platform lifecycle, that is basically our cluster uh, lifecycle, so lab all the way up to our production clusters. Mm -hmm. And uh, I primarily work with a guy named Aaron Morris, and he's the lead over the infrastructure side. And we work together to really make a one holistic, successful platform as a whole to, to like the uh, app teams at Delta. So. Yeah, so one thing to add about the PaaS team. So we talked a lot about cloud native and being multi-cloud. This was our first stop on our cloud native journey. So we implemented OpenShift within our on-prem um, data center, and we've since enabled a lot of development teams to deploy there. So the next step in our, of our journey is to enable teams to kind of stretch into the different cloud providers that we're going to work with in the future. So all of the products, we plan on just carrying them forward within each individual multi-public um, cloud. All right, so moving on to our tooling. So we talked about the PaaS. I talked about tools this morning, kind of, but I'm just going to kind of talk through exactly what our implementation was, maybe some of the challenges we had in implementing some of the tools. Um, I'll cover the CI, and Chris will cover the CD. So kicking off um, this kind of picture here, um, we start with the plan phase. So we use something called version 1. Anybody familiar with version 1? Oh, I, someone looks scared. He's like, oh, man. 
Horrible. Oh, man. <laughs> no. Okay. So a lot of folks use Jira for this. But because we're working on um, kind of scaling Agile at Delta, it, it more readily supports our uh, team of teams. So we're using version one um, for the software development lifecycle. Um, and as you all know, GitLab as well. So when we first started our journey with GitLab, it was solely create, right? We were leveraging for, for version control, distributed version control. So upon implementing that, we thought, okay, there's a lot more features here that we weren't really counting on leveraging. So we kind of put those other features on the back burner and got what, and got what the developers were asking for, which was Sonatype Nexus and Jenkins for CI. So in implementing Sonatype Nexus, we you know, of course created our internal repository that um, proxied our Maven Central, um, MPM, JS, all of the, the large um, module providers out there. Um, and that way, our developers could come to one internal place for all of the dependencies that they were seeking. We were hoping in the future to provide visibility into what open source libraries they were using so that we can eventually hopefully govern that and provide some visibility into any just risk that was out there. So after implementing that, we got SonarCube, which of course we use to manage code quality and to ensure that our development community is not building in technical debt to all the new development that is happening at Delta. Um, we're also very, very, very focused on implementing test-driven development. Um, as you all probably know, that is a huge mind shift for a developer to make, especially if you're not used, you, you, used to writing any test at all. So writing tests first, it seems like, whoa, why would I ever want to do that? Um, so we're working um, very closely. Our dev practice lead is actually right there. Encore, <laughs> you want to wave your hand? He's um, the driver of that, and he has a very hard job. So thank you, Encore, for all that you do. All right, so moving into the CD portion, I'll throw it over to Chris. For yeah, so example. I worked with Jasmine a lot on the CI portion in 2017. We really both joined Delta and then worked on bringing in GitLab, Nexus, and Archive, et cetera. So some of these other ones, uh, we actually didn't help bring into the company. Other teams did. Um, but we use ServiceNow for our change management process incidents and things like that. Uh, we use OpenShift as our pass solution, so whether that's on-prem or public cloud. And then we use Dynatrace and Sumo Logic for logging and monitoring. So we didn't really have a big, uh, I guess, insight into bringing those into the organization, um, but they do play a, pull, uh, you know, a part of the whole picture. So, um, but one thing I do want to note on this slide, I guess, is if you're looking at just kind of the whole picture across the board, if you look at this slide, it, it took six teams to onboard all of these tools into Delta. And, so, and then today, we have four different teams that represent all of these different tools. And there's even more tools out there that are not on this picture. But if you are an app team at Delta, one thing that we're looking at is, OK, I'm an app team, and I'm starting to become a DevOps team, and I'm having to onboard all these different tools. So basically, now I have to engage four or six different teams to kind of onboard to their product, right? So I have to go to the Dynatrace team, and I have to you know, get that set up, and the Sumo team, and get that set up, and then OpenShift, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we found is we've done something called a metrics-based process mapping exercise. And if you look at kind of all the tools and everything they have to go through, um, it's quite a lot. So one thing we're starting to look at going forward with some of our tooling is, OK, what can we look at from a holistic viewpoint of, OK, when a developer or an app team comes forward and they need to use all these tools, how can we make that more seamless to the app teams? How can we get them up and going faster so that it's less taxing to the app teams and just kind of a waste of their time and a lot of admin work? Uh, so that's one thing we're going to be looking at as far as this kind of like pipeline goes. Yeah, I think one thing to add to that is that a lot of the teams that we, you just talked about, the Dynatrace team, Sumo Logic, they're not familiar with the infrastructure as code concept. So we had to have a, you know, a really like a education session with them to get them familiar with these concepts so that they can leverage the automation to enable our development community further. So that was another step that we had. All right, good. Move on. Yeah. All right. So this is like the meat of our talk, and um, it's the timeline of our cloud journey at Delta. I hope that you all can kind of see that, but um, our first stop was Q1 of 2017. So I start, started, this morning I talked a little bit about Rahul joining the company and focusing on availability and reliability. 
So in 2017, we kind of kicked off the process of what type of waste are we introducing at Delta? Um, so we did some research and figuring out what, what areas were we wasting the most time? And out of that conversation, you know, infrastructure was one of, number one on the list, infrastructure. It took, I think, four to six weeks to get a server provisioned. And all of that time that developers were waiting was, is, was waste, really. So um, we started having conversations with PaaS providers um, to just really enable developers to quickly provision infrastructure and have it just ready to go when they were ready to deploy to it. So that was kind of what kicked off our journey. And Chris actually had a hand in selecting our, our paths that we went with, which was Red Hat. So I'm going to throw it over to you to talk through what that selection process was like. Yeah, so first on the infrastructure side, uh, I think it was more like four to six months. OK, I was being nice. <laughs> it was a long time. So <laughs> that's, it took a long time for uh, you know, developers to get up and going with infrastructure and different things like that. So uh, we were definitely looking at different paths providers. And one of those was OpenShift. And so, we looked at OpenShift and we did a six week POC uh, with Red Hat and uh, we basically just worked with an app team and, and just looked at kind of the product and worked with them and, and we, just, we signed a contract with Red Hat at the end of 2017 and we made that the, the PaaS for Delta. So that kind of kicked off the initiative of just the PaaS first mentality that you know we're, everything's PaaS first going forward. So, you know, developers, they, they, they know we have a PaaS solution. They don't really have to worry about the infrastructure as much. They just know, okay, we have production clusters out there, and they can start deploying to those production clusters. Yeah. Um, so it got them up and going a lot faster. But before we got there, we went to, uh, we, we first started with uh, three pilot teams in Q1. And so we actually started not as the Delta PaaS team. We actually started as the CAP team. It's the uh, container adoption program. And so this is really just kind of a project spike um, where we said, OK, we're going to do this thing for six months. And we're still kind of in that stage. We haven't really gone from project to product. But CAP team was kind of a project spike where we took three applications. And we said, OK, we're going to deploy these three applications to OpenShift. We're going to you know, build the infrastructure and the clusters as we go up to production. So we actually picked three applications. They were checking API, airport inquiry, and another one I'm drawing a blank right now. So checking API is actually really cool. Uh, checking API was, uh, it basically is seamless check-in. So if you fly on Delta and you fly on another partner airline, when you go check-in on Delta, it checks you into both flight to the same time. So if you've ever flown, like, say, Delta and American Airlines, you've had to check in on Delta and then have to go check in on another airline, like American or something like that. So that one is now in production and running, and it's supposed to be a seamless check-in experience for our customers. They don't have to do multiple uh, check-ins. So that was really cool um, to see that go live and take traffic. Uh, and then that's when we started to form the, uh, the PaaS team. So we said, OK, uh, we're not, we're, you know, we get the whole project thing. This is going to another project spike, whatever. We're going to try to act as a product team. That's where we want to be. We want to form a backlog of items. Mm -hmm. We want to see what our customers are needing. And we don't want to just have to go off and try to leave this here and go you know, eventually have another project spike come along. Mm -hmm. So uh, we formed the PaaS team. And we kind of just stuck together in a room. And uh, you know we're, we're busting out of that room now. Yeah. But uh, basically, yeah, we just said, OK, we're going to do this. And we're going to have features and a backlog and that kind of thing. So yeah. um, and then along came at Mod. Yeah, so um, out of the PaaS team and the CAP team um, implementing those three pilot apps, there were some patterns that were established. So we were able to figure out what it took from start to finish to get an application from ideation all the way to production. So that was a good thing that we established. So out of that pattern came application modernization efforts. So at Delta, we have a ton of applications that can do many, many different things. Um, so in Q3, we began identifying the applications that should be retained, retired, or replatformed into more modern infrastructure. So 60 applications were targeted for replatforming into more modern infrastructure, and that became our application modernization effort. So we brought in a large team of individuals that went on to implement these 60 applications using middleware such as JBoss, EAP, OpenJDK. I think there was some node in there. 
Node.js. Yeah. Node.js in there as well. And this was all new territory for us because we had used standard middleware before, but now we were trying to figure out, okay, how do we get 60 applications through? I think it was in like a six month time frame or a nine month time frame. It was about six months. Six months. So it was very, very intense. Um, but the great thing out of app that came out of app mod was an established pattern for now middleware. So with middleware, we had standard legacy middleware at Delta. We had, I think, Blade Logic. We had some WebSphere in there, things like that. But when utilizing these new middleware technologies, especially in conjunction with the PaaS, we had to not only get the app teams up and running, but get the middleware teams up and running. So we had a chance to partner with them and bring them into the PaaS team so that they can contribute those um, images and things like that. So that was really beautiful. So after AppMod, we really had a community going. So we had all of the app teams that were now in production from AppMod. We had the three pilot apps. So we had a little community thing happening. So we did what anyone would do. We started a Slack channel so that we could get the community to support the community that, for everyone that was using um, our OpenShift platform as a service. An, another important, important piece of this, um, the community aspect, was Passport. So it's, this is a very clever name, Passport. So all of our documentation now lived in one place. So those patterns I talked about that came out of the AppMod effort, we had all of the documentation there so that everyone could consume that in the Delta organization. Fast forward to Q1 of this year, um, we're really focused on developer experience, as I talked about. So making it easy for developers to get onto the platform and creating a low barrier of entry. I think one of the key things that we put out this year was certificate management. So not having to think about, oh, how do I get this certificate, applying it to um, an OpenShift, um, and actually creating automation around um, annotations within your version control to say, I need a cert, give it to me. So I think that was really cool. You had a hand in that. You want to talk more about it? Yeah, just to add a little bit to the PaaS community as well. Yeah. We have about 400 people in the PaaS channel now. It can get a little noisy at times, but it's, a, it's really great because everyone basically at Delta knows about it and they go to it and it's growing. And a lot of times, you know, it's just a simple link like, oh, here's a document, you know, that we've created for this question or whatever. So, um, and then we've even had people out in the community, um, you know, answer questions and, and help us out as well as uh, all of our Anything with OpenShift is all in GitLab, and so we basically kind of done the inner source thing and said, you know, hey, if you want to add documentation or if you want to add some automation or something like that, hey, you know, go here and you can do it. Um, you know, I'll put it in our backlog, and we'll you know get to it in whatever couple sprints or whatever, right? So that that's been really really big and really uh, fruitful for our organization. Um, so, and then on the developer experience side, yeah, the certificate management. So. We started out with the certificate management. Um, I know that uh, Jetstack has created the cert manager. And at the time, uh, we used Venify as our store for certificates. At the time, cert manager was a little earlier on, and they didn't have Venify as an issuer. So uh, we actually worked with Red Hat to create a product called Cert Operator. And so we did a lot of work around that to automate the routing layer in OpenShift so that we could just automate that certificate level. Um, so that was really great. It, it just provided a, an easy way. Basically, an app team would say, I need a cert, and then it would just go to Venify, create a certificate, and apply it to their route. It was very easy for them. It's fully automated. They did everything through a pipeline. You know, everything was in their GitLab repo. It was, it was really great. Um, so then, that was awesome. And then after that, we basically kind of rolled into Q2 of 2019, where all of our infrastructure was on just temporary hardware. So then we started moving to the permanent hardware, we call it. And um, so basically, we, we had our clusters, and we built clusters on the side. And we said, OK, you know, these are the permanent hardware for applications now. You now you have to migrate over here. We did side-by-side -side clusters instead of in-place upgrades, since uh, anyway, but uh, basically what that enabled is our mission critical applications. That was kind of the whole initiative of this permanent hardware aspect and, and moving away from some of the old. So some of the applications that are onboarding now are something like Snap. So Snap covers, uh, you know, baggage and things like that. So when you go check your bag in, you know, if it's on your phone. Uh, they even have integrations into Clear if you're a Clear customer. Mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of, uh, you know, just 
places throughout the airport you go, you're, inter you're talking to Snap uh, in the background. Uh, that enables other, other applications to onboard as well. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the effort of Q2. Um, so, and then going into Q3 is basically securing images. So we talked about some of our supported technologies and that kind of thing. Uh, it was really about, you know, we have one central repository for all the containers, base middleware containers that can run on our platform. And we've kind of taken the approach of, you know, here's all the containers we can run, and if we create a cluster, we basically just run our pipeline against that cluster to, to make all the images available to the, to the app teams. Um, so it was basically about securing those, making sure they have like the delta certs in them and that kind of thing, but uh, you know, kind of the delta labels or whatnot on there. Um, so that's been you know also uh, really awesome because we've had app teams contribute like agents, and we're looking at like GitLab runners and things like that for the community, and um, you know, pretty exciting stuff. So you want to talk about the Q4? Yeah, so end-to-end -end encryption and fully automating our process. So we talked about onboarding in the beginning and how disjointed that process sort of is right now. Um, so our goal for Q4 of this year is to automate, automate, automate. How can we make it easier for application teams to onboard and how can we make that process just really you know, um, predictable? Um, so what, the first thing that we're gonna do is automate the provisioning of sandboxes. For us, that's the first step for developers, to get a sandbox within the OpenShift environment, um, pick and choose which middleware technologies they want to leverage, and just get their feet wet, essentially. Because if you think about it, if we enable them in that way, we can have more people getting educated just really based off of that, based off of automated sandbox provisioning. And then we're going to take it a step forward further into higher level environments like DVL and, and hopefully eventually production. And that, that, I think, will help us kind of onboard a little bit faster um, in the end, going into 2020. So that is Q4. Um, yeah. Thinking forward to 2020, now that we've signed deals with public cloud providers, we're also looking at installing an open shift within the public pr cloud providers that we've selected so that we can kind of prove out what are some of the models that we're going to have. When are we going to choose to leverage the public cloud and how are we going to facilitate that from a development standpoint? So I think that's definitely one thing that we'll have to look at in 2020. Any yeah. 2020 thoughts for you? Well, has anyone worked with operators yet? Because that's, that's what we're basically using to automate all of this. You know, mm -hmm. the automated sandbox provisioning, it's basically just an operator sitting there. Someone just goes to the cluster and automatically provisions a namespace for them. Uh, some things are Git driven. Um, so we're looking at a lot of the automation and just really how do we, if you go back to the tooling slide, how do we onboard someone in just a holistic manner so that it's, it's more seamless, it's less taxing to the, to the app teams yeah. um, and that kind of thing. So continuously improve that process mm -hmm. and uh, make it faster. Uh, and like she said, we're, we're going to AWS as well, so uh, we're going to be running OpenShift out there, and uh, right now we're kind of in the sandbox land for AWS, but we do have a few applications that are going to be going there mm -hmm. uh, as well, so that's super exciting because we'll have some running on-prem and also in the public cloud, and so the communication back and forth and those kinds of conversations are happening, but um, yeah. so it's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, new challenges, very exciting. So hopefully this time next year we'll be back to share more about how we've grown in the public cloud space. But I hope that our cloud journey has been meaningful and educational for you. Um, looks like we have about six whole minutes for questions. So does anyone have any questions? And uh, someone's going to go around with a mic. Yeah, John's going to have one. Uh, one question about uh, data, uh, data lakes. Uh, do you process any kind of data in, the, in OpenShift? Are you connecting uh, to, uh, yeah. I don't know, I mean, uh, do you have Spark, Hadoop, things like that yeah. running OpenShift? Is it separated or have you switched your, your workload, something, something like that? Yeah, so right now, um, like the four things we can run on OpenShift are OpenJDK, JBoss, EAP, JDG, and Node.js. So there's no persistence on OpenShift yet. Right now, our backing service is ClusterFS. And so um, we can't run any databases right now. Basically, that's uh, we we've spent a lot of money off-platform uh, for database 
Hadoop, et cetera. And so, but eventually, yeah, we are looking to potentially run some pieces on there. Uh, in the near term, probably object, tor object store type stuff. Um, and so, yeah, we're looking to replace ClusterFS with like something like pure storage or something like that, so. Yeah, awesome. Any other questions? Yeah, hi guys, thanks oh. for the presentation. A question I had in the beginning of your presentation or whether when I came in, you mentioned that you are or are transitioning or did transition to test-driven development. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, when did that journey begin and who initiated it in your organization and who supported it? I'm trying to look at the culture side of test-driven dri development. Yeah, I would say that it started um, right around when Encore joined our team in early, early 2018, I would say. A little bit before that. So Encore came from a large channels organization where they were already doing these things. But our challenge from a COE standpoint was propagating and disseminating that knowledge across the organization so that we could provide the best practice and practices and direction um, first and foremost. But then from a dojo standpoint, also teach teams how to do this. So that was a large piece, not only just mandating it, but also teaching them from the ground up what is test-driven development, what are the benefits. And our CTO, um, KK, um, he supports, supported us in this uh, educational, I think, journey, I would call it, um, through funding the dojo and allowing us to kind of build out curriculum and provide that to teams. Um, and he's fully supported by our CIO, CIO Rahul Saman, as well. So we have lots of support for it, um, and the value is there. We just have to get people to um, just do it, I think, and a lot of that is the enablement that is happening in our speed-to-market dojo right now.